I may give it to you. Thanks, Mar. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Huxel. I'm a senior application engineer with MathWorks and our Galway office in Ireland. Uh, I've included a picture here of my myself uh, just to put a, a face to the voice, but I also thought I'd take this opportunity to show you a fun application of, of deep learning before we get started and talking about more practical applications. So one of the examples that we have in our documentation is using deep learning for neural style transfer. So here I have uh, my picture, and I also have a Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh below. So I can use a neural network to extract features from the content image, my, my profile image, and texture from the style image, the Starry Night image. So when I can do that, I can then have that neural network, network combine those back together. And here we have a picture of what I might look like if Vincent van Gogh had uh, painted me in the motif of, of Starry Night. So that's just kind of a, a fun example of, of deep learning. So we're going to talk today about much more practical applications, applications that might actually save lives uh, as opposed to just uh, being more artistic like this. If you're interested in learning more about this, uh, like I said, this is one of the documentation examples. So a more practical example, uh, here we have uh, an example from Genentech, who we worked with to develop a convolutional neural network for a digital pathology analysis. So they use the UNET deep learning model for semantic segmentation. So semantic segmentation, if you haven't heard that before, that's where you're, you're taking an image and you're trying to classify it uh, on a pixel by pixel basis. So in this case, they're looking for uh, trying to identify tumors in the image or uh, necrotic uh, tissue in the image. So they have to first start with a bunch of images, label all of those pixels, and then train a network to be able to detect uh, those pixels in new images. So now that we have some motivation for today's uh, seminar, here is our agenda. So I'm going to spend actually quite a bit of time in this first bullet on introduction and demonstration. So for introduction, I'm going to cover some of the basic concepts and terminology for machine learning and deep learning. I understand that we have a pretty diverse audience. Uh, so I want to, uh, to kind of keep it high level, but also give some, some tips and tricks that'll be useful for more experienced users as well. And then I will also spend a fair bit of time in MATLAB actually demonstrating uh, the, how you would do this in MATLAB. We'll come back to the slides to talk about the workflow in a little bit more detail. So preparing data, training a model, and then deploying that system. And then finally, we'll summarize. I'll offer you some, some tips on how to get started, uh, some tips for support. And then as more mentioned, we'll, we'll, we'll finish it up with a Q&A session. So some basic definitions. Artificial intelligence is a very broadly and widely used term these days. Essentially, it's just the ability of a computer to perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings. So this does not necessarily imply that the computer is learning. So in that regard, we're going to talk a bit about machine learning. So machine learning is when we actually use data uh, without a predetermined model uh, to try to, uh, to come up with a model. So I think the best way to think about this is to compare it with a classical approach. So in classical programming, we have data, we already have a model, and we're trying to compute a response. With machine learning, we flip this around, and we have data and a response, and we're trying to determine what the model is. So you can think of this as we have uh, some, some inputs, we know what the desired output should be, we're going to train a model such that it can predict that desired output for those inputs. And this will make a little bit more sense, I think, as we, as we continue. A subset of that, then, is deep learning. And the big difference between general machine learning and deep learning is that uh, the model learns to perform tasks directly from the images, text, sound, signals, and so on. Um, to clarify that a little bit more, for machine learning, there's this manual feature extraction step. So let's say we have some signals. Uh, maybe the important features of that signal are the mean or the variance. Um, maybe it's the frequency content. 
if it's images like in our case today, um, you know, we can extract uh, features from that image as well. So, but that's a first step before we start training our machine learning model. Deep learning, on the other hand, that step is an inherent part of the learning process. So we don't have to take this pre-step of manual feature extraction. Um, that happens uh, inherently uh, through the end-to-end -end learning process. So, and as I mentioned before, that could be for images, text, sound, as well as other signal data. Another differentiator between the two is that machine learning tends to saturate, whereas deep learning continues to scale with data. So uh, often with machine learning, you can only throw so much data at the problem and you're not gonna get a better solution. Whereas with deep learning, typically you can continue to give it new data and improve your model. So we have um, an AI biomedical workshop that explores this complete, complete pipeline. So it looks at machine learning, it looks at deep learning. Uh, it does it for, we can do that for images as well as signals. Today we're talking about images. So with images, one of the first steps, especially for that semantic segmentation example that I showed you at the beginning, is that we need to label the data. So you can imagine that labeling individual pixels in an image can be extremely tedious. So we have some apps to help automate that process uh, and make it a, a lot less painful. The workshop then explores creating and training deep learning models. So we do that for a semantic segmentation example, like I mentioned. Um, in this case, that example is segmenting out the left ventricle of a, of a heart valve. Um, and then we also have an image classification problem where instead of trying to classify individual pixels, you're trying to classify the image as a whole. So that's actually the problem we're gonna uh, demonstrate today. So we're gonna use some blood smear images to try to determine what type of parasite might be infecting that blood. The workshop also covers uh, machine learning models. So it talks about how to use feature extraction uh, as that pre-processing step before you train your machine learning model. And then it expands that example to talk about uh, hyperparameter optimization. So that's the process of tuning the parameters that are used to train the model. So that's one way you can improve the accuracy. We also talk about other ways in the workshop. And then finally, deploying models. So this could be generating code uh, to run on an embedded uh, device or an uh, edge device. So today, we don't have time to cover all of this. Uh, we have a short session today. So we're just gonna talk about this one little piece of the, the workshop. So we're gonna, as I mentioned, we're gonna use a deep learning model to classify images of blood smears. And I'll talk more about that when we jump into MATLAB. Since we're performing image classification, we're gonna use a convolutional neural network. So if you've never seen this before, uh, don't worry, I'm not going to go into too much detail on what each of these different layers does, but I wanted to point this out at a high level. So here we have, as I mentioned, a convolutional neural network, and the, the couple of components that we're going to really focus on today are the input layer and the fully connected and classification layers at the end. Okay, so the input layer is how we're going to provide the network with new images. And the fully connected layer at the end is going to uh, help us classify that image. So in this case, we have a network that's trying to uh, detect if the image is a car, truck, van, bicycle, uh, so on. So different, different types of vehicles. The other thing I wanted to point out about this is the early layers of the network, the ones closer to the input layer, those layers are uh, extracting features and looking for features that are, are very generic and uh, common to, to images in general. So those are things like colors and edges and blobs, uh, things that are not particular or so, uh, specific to vehicles. So those are things that will uh, be useful uh, for other images as well. As you progress from left to right, from the input layer to the output layer, to the classification layer, the network is gonna learn uh, increasingly more complex features. So maybe towards the end, it's starting to recognize 
uh, things that are circular and start to look like wheels. Um, so again, we'll talk more about that and, and, and wrap an example around that when we get into MATLAB. But just keep, uh, keep those layers in mind. But before we do that, for those that might be new to deep learning, I wanted to give you a little bit of, of background on some of the jargon and, and how this process works. So I mentioned the input layer. That's how we're going to pass data into the network. Uh, we have a bunch of hidden layers in the middle, and then we're going to have our output layer. So for visualization on this slide, we're just showing three layers, but normally there's many more layers than that. Uh, deep learning gets its name uh, from the depth of the network, the number of, of layers that it has. Uh, so once we have a network architecture, we're going to train that network. So training is the process of tuning the weights in the hidden layers so that the predicted output matches the expected output. So if we have a picture of a car and we know it's a car, when we uh, pass that to the network, if it gives us a different answer than car, we need to tune the weights uh, so that it gives us the, the answer we're expecting. Once we've trained a network, the process of making predictions with that network is called inference. So inference is when we pass a new input to the network and we ask it uh, for a new prediction. So how does this work? So an iteration is one pass of a subset of training data through the network. OK, so let's say over here on the left, I've got a whole bunch of images. I'm just going to make up a number. We'll say we have 600 images. I can break that up into subsets. In this case, I've broken it up into six subsets, which means that our mini batch has 100 images in each one of these boxes. An iteration is each time we pass one of those boxes through the network. Every time we do that, we're going to update the weights. So once the network has seen all 600 images, we call that an epoch. So an, um, so an epoch is when all of the 600 images have passed through uh, through the network. In this case, they've passed through in six subsets. It didn't have to be six. I just made that number up for this slide. Um, we could have divided it into three subsets of 200 images each, or two subsets of 300 images each. Um, so that's so these three or these two things are you'll see later are parameters that we're going to have to set when we train our network, the mini batch and the uh, epochs. The last uh, major definition I want you to know is the learn rate. So you can think of this as one giant optimization problem, and we're trying to find uh, the minimum. If we set the learn rate very, very small, uh, the training will take a very long time. It'll take a very long time to converge on that, that minimum. Whereas if you set the learn rate too high, we might just bounce around back and forth and uh, skip over what that minimum. So that's another one of the parameters that we're going to need to pick and choose when we start our training. So there are two approaches for deep learning. Back in the day, your only option was to start from scratch. Uh, so for that, you can imagine that requires quite a bit of expertise in deep learning. It's also going to require a large number of uh, images for training data and a lot of computational time to train that network. Nowadays, we're very fortunate that we have many different pre-trained models to choose from. Uh, so we're going to pick one, one model today and, and start with that instead of starting from scratch. So with the pre-trained model, as I mentioned on that convolutional neural network slide, um, a lot of those early layers that were used to detect things like colors and blobs and edges, uh, that information is still really good and we don't need to retrain it to do those tasks. So in our case, we can take a pre-trained network, make some minor modifications to it, retrain it with a smaller subset of data that is relevant to our problem, and then we can make new predictions. So in this case, this original network was designed to detect vehicles. We're going to feed it some new images of cats and dogs, and then it can retrain it, and then it can make predictions on cats and dogs. So you can imagine that not only do we require less expertise to get started, but also far less training data and less computational time for training. 
So this is what that workflow looks like in a little bit more detail. So we're going to load a pre-trained network. In our case today, we're going to use uh, Alex Network, which is one of the um, kind of most popular networks from a, from a while back. Nowadays, there are a lot of other uh, new networks you can use instead. Um, AlexNet was trained on millions of images to predict a thousand different classes. So as you see in this slide, those early layers are still very useful for us. And then the last few layers are the ones that are specific to our task. So what we're going to do is we're going to take those last few layers. We're going to uh, swap them out, do a little bit of surgery on the network, and uh, then we can use them uh, for our purpose. So in order to do so, after we modify the network, we'll need to retrain it. But this time, instead of millions of images, we only need a handful of images. And instead of predicting 1,000 classes, in our case today, we're going to predict one of three classes. Once you've done that, you can then show the network some new data that it's never seen before and predict and assess the accuracy. Once you're happy with the performance, the last step would be to deploy the results. So this could be to generate code that runs on an embedded device, for example. Okay, so with that in mind, that's the, the workflow that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. So now we'll jump into uh, MATLAB. So for those that, that haven't seen MATLAB in a while, I just wanted to uh, point out uh, a few new things or things that might be new to you. So first, I'm running this as a MATLAB project. So MATLAB project is uh, a new uh, capability within the last couple of releases. And essentially, it allows you to collaborate with your colleague, colleagues much easier. Um, it allows you to have lots of different um, functions. You can quickly check to see the dependency uh, of those functions, so which functions are required by other functions, for example. It uh, quickly tells you which products are going to be needed to run your project. Um, and it's also uh, integrated with Git. So this makes it really easy to collaborate. You can pull down the latest version, push up updates to your colleagues. Um, so I've actually found this very, very useful for working with my, my fellow AEs here at MathWorks. A couple of other things I wanted to point out. Uh, so if you're new to MATLAB and you're importing data, this import data button can be really helpful to get you up and running quickly. If you're a more experienced MATLAB user, um, and you have multiple cores on your machine, maybe you want to run things in parallel to speed up uh, the duration it takes to run your simulations. And then also we have the add-ons button and the help button. Uh, so the add-ons button is where you can go to quickly add uh, deep learning models for use in MATLAB. So for example, if today I wanted to use AlexNet, I can go to the add-ons and go ahead and grab it. You can see I already have it installed. Um, I also wanted to point out the apps tab here. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later as we use a couple of these. But this is another great way to familiarize yourself with new toolboxes. Uh, it, it's an interactive way to get started. You don't have to spend half a day reading documentation. You can just quickly do things interactively. Um, and then the real power of it is once you've done it interactively, you can generate MATLAB code to do it programmatically in the future. Uh, so you'll see, you know, we can use this to create and train a network, and then we can generate the code. So if we get new data later on, uh, we can just run that script instead of doing everything interactively. Okay, so, but now I want to dive into the example at hand today. Um, you might notice here that this, if you haven't seen a live script before, this might look a little different than you're used to. So we still have .m files, uh, the standard plain text format uh, MATLAB scripts, but you can now also embed rich text formatting, images, hyperlinks, equations, uh, automatically generate table of contents. You can do all of that right in your MATLAB code. So these gray boxes that you're seeing, this is MATLAB code. Everything else you can think of as just a comment. MATLAB's going to ignore it. So that, all the rest of it is, is really for the humans so that we can um, better comment our code. Uh, 
So the problem today is we're going to take a bunch of images of blood smears and we're gonna use deep learning uh, to try to classify those images, uh, be them uh, babesiosis, plasmodium, or trypnosomoniasis. Uh, so you can see here I have a folder of those images. And I've put each of the different infection types in its own folder, which will come in uh, handy in a second. So in order to work with these images, we need to let Mat MATLAB know where these images are. So one of the easy, easiest ways to do that in MATLAB is to use what's called an image data store. So if you've never heard of that before, and actually this goes for all of the functions you see today, you can always right click on something and ask for help. So if you wanna learn more about image data stores or any of the other functions we use today, uh, that's an easy way to learn more. But essentially what this does is it's just gonna go and grab the location of all the images. So I have this blood smear image folder. So I'm going to use a data store to grab everything in that blood smear image folder. I'm gonna ask it to grab all the subfolders and I'm gonna use the folder names to label my data. So as I mentioned, if we're training a network, it needs to know what the expected output is in order to tune those weights. So we're gonna tell it what the expected output is just simply by using the folder name as the label. So I'm gonna run this code section by section. So I'm gonna run this section. When I do that, you can see that the, the image data store, it, it didn't load in all of the images. It just points to where all the images are at. MATLAB will then pull in the images as it needs it, as it needs them. So you don't have to worry about loading in thousands of images into memory at one time. It'll just pull them in as it needs it. So the variable type for this is called an image data store. So if you might see more and more in MATLAB nowadays, there are variable types that are not just your simple logical numeric character. Um, there's more of these custom data types like this image data store. So whenever you see one of these and you wanna learn more, I would encourage you to check the properties and the methods. So the properties, is gonna tell me all of the, you can think of it as like the metadata for this variable. So here it's gonna tell me which files are associated with this data store, what the labels are, and so on. The methods you can think of as which functions I can use on this variable. So I can use these different uh, functions here, these different methods. I'm gonna use count each label and split each label in a moment. So what this is gonna do, uh, count each label, for example, will just go in there and tell me how many of each uh, infection type I have. And split each label will allow me to quickly and easily split that data store or that, those data sets into um, separate subsets. So we're gonna want one subset for testing and we're gonna want one subset for training. So the idea is we're gonna train our network on one set of data and then we want a set of data that it's never seen before to do our testing to see what the accuracy was. So as I mentioned, I'm now gonna use that split each label. In this case, I'm going to use it to pull in three uh, images from each label just to have a quick look. I find it's, it's often useful to take a look at your data before you start doing too much. So each one of these rows corresponds to uh, one of our labels, so one of our parasitic infections. First thing that jumps out at me is that you can see there's quite a range of exposure and contrast and color density uh, in these images. So in our machine learning workshop, we talk about how we need to pre-process these images in order to um, make them suitable for training. So uh, in the case of deep learning, however, one of the first steps that the, train, that the training function is gonna do by default is automatically normalize all of the images. So it takes care of that, um, that issue for us. So now that we've taken a look, I'm now gonna count up each label and see what our, our data set looks like. So I'm gonna see how many do I have for each of the different parasitic infections. It's kind of hard to fit it all on the screen here, but you can see that 
I've got far more plasmodiums uh, than the other two labels. So if I were to train right now, uh, I would bias the network towards plasmodium because it's seen many, many more plasmodium images. So we don't want it to artificially favor one label over the other. So we have a few different ways we could approach this. Uh, we could add some weights when we train to, to, get, to get it to balance how, it, how much it favors each of these labels. Um, ideally, we would get more images of the other two to bring them up to the same number of images or around the same number as plasmodium. Um, that's not always an option though. So in our case, what we're gonna do is just simply lop off uh, the extra images from plasmodium and just uh, set the number of images from each label down to the minimum value. So in this case, it looks like the minimum is around 16 or so. So to do that, I'm going to calculate what the minimum is. I'm then gonna use that minimum to split my, my data store again, such that I only have 16 images from each label. I'm then gonna split it, use that split each label method again to split it into a, a training set and a test set. So we'll take 70% of the images and use them for training and we'll save 30% for testing. So now when I do that, you can see that I have a nice balanced data set. I've got about uh, 11 images in each label for training and five images in each label for testing. So that's not a lot of images. Um, in, a, in, in a real world application, hopefully you would have much more data available to you. Um, but this is just a simple example to kind of give you the, uh, the concept of the workflow. And this is yet another reason why we really need to use transfer learning. If we tried to train from scratch with this few images, I don't think it would go very well. So speaking of transfer learning, our next step is to uh, load in AlexNet or whatever network you choose. So since we used the add-on manager earlier, uh, it's literally just one line of code to bring AlexNet into MATLAB. I mentioned the importance of the first layer. So we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the first layer. That's what we're doing here. And you'll notice that AlexNet is expecting an input size of 227 pixels by 227 pixels by three. Uh, the three is just because it's expecting RGB images. So red, green, blue, three channel images. I'm gonna load in an image from our data set. I'm just gonna pick the 16th image. Uh, you can pick whichever one you want. And I'm gonna check what the size of it is. So when I check the size of our original image, you see it's 300 by 300 by three. So in order to use these images with AlexNet, they're gonna to need to be resized to the appropriate size, in particular 227 by 227. So I'm gonna use the function IM resize to do that. So most of the functions for image processing are gonna start with IM. So if you wanna crop an image, it's IM crop and so on. So once I do that, you'll see that my inputs image is now the appropriate size. So now that it's the appropriate size, I can use that network that we loaded, which was AlexNet, and I can classify my image. So given that AlexNet was trained to detect 1,000 classes and none of them are parasitic infections, it's obviously not gonna be able to to classify our image correctly, but let's see what it thinks. So it was trained to detect things like animals, everyday objects, vehicles, things like that. Uh, so it said, well, that looks like a honeycomb to me, which given the fact that it was not trained on parasitic infections, seems like a reasonable prediction. Uh, so in order to modify this network for our purposes, we're going to need to change those last few layers. So at this point, I'm going to jump into the apps tab here. So if I open up the deep network designer, you'll see that I can load in uh, many available pre-trained networks. I'm gonna go ahead and pick AlexNet. When it loads in the network, we can see AlexNet is a relatively simple network. It's a serial network which will make it uh, pretty easy for us and straightforward for us to replace some of the layers here. So if I look at 
I mentioned, you know, the last few layers are the ones we're interested in. If I look at the fully connected layer, we'll see that it's outputting a 1,000 um, classes. So we don't want that. We want to, it to be three. So I'm going to grab a new fully connected block. I'm going to change that to three. The default is 10. Likewise, you'll see that the output size here, it inherits this automatically to be 1,000. So I'm going to grab a new output layer, a classification layer. I'm then going to delete these, reconnect everything up. And at this point, it's a usually a good idea to just quickly analyze your network. So we'll ask MATLAB, hey, did I, did I break anything when I made those changes? And you'll see here that we didn't. We still have 25 layers, uh, no warnings, no errors. So we're, we're good to, to go with training. So you could export at this point, or you can stay in the app and just continue the workflow. So I'm going to move on to the data tab. I'm going to import some training data. So recall we had set that as an image data store in MATLAB. So I'm going to pull in that set of 33 training images. As I mentioned, that's not a lot of images. So to make the, the network more robust to a, a wider variety of images, we can also add some augmentation. And by that, I mean each time we use one of these images to train the network, we can have it add some randomness. So we can randomly reflect it. Uh, rotate it, uh, translate it. So you have a few different options here. So I'll just pick a few of these. So instead of just having 33 images now, um, it's still the same 33 images, but the network is seeing a wider variety uh, of images. Normally, you would also set aside a third set of data for validation. So this is data that's used during the training process to validate as you go. This is a really small data set. So for this example, I'm just going to ignore that. You'll notice that MATLAB warns me that I now am not protected against overfitting. Um, so normally you, you would want enough data to do that, but for this simple example, I'll just skip that. So as we saw before, we have a nicely balanced training data set. I can move on to the training tab and I'm going to pick some training options. So here's where you're going to see uh, those options that I kind of defined earlier and why I thought they were so important. So the key ones, the initial learn rate, uh, and the epochs and the mini batch size. So the question naturally right now is how do you pick these numbers? Um, there is not a kind of a one size fits all solution. So I'm just going to pick some numbers that I was using earlier. But uh, after I work through this example, I'm going to uh, show you a way that you can do this more programmatically to pick these numbers. And I went ahead and stuck with the default options for most, most of those. Okay, so now that I have my training options set, I can go ahead and train the network. So here's where you'll see that first step where it's going to normalize the images. So we don't have a whole lot of images, so that won't be on the screen for very long. But here you can see it's, it's normalizing the input data. And then it's going to be off and running to do the training. So on the top in blue, we have the accuracy. I'll give it a second to, to catch up. Yes, yeah, so we have the, the accuracy. Hopefully that continues to go up towards 100%. But even if we hit 100% for our Training, that doesn't guarantee that we'll have 100% with new images the network has never seen before. Uh, another important thing to pay attention to is the loss. So the loss is giving us an indication of whether or not the network is still learning. So if the loss is decreasing, the network is still learning. If the loss is not decreasing, then you're not learning anymore, and you're going to need uh, some more uh, input images or there's other, other knobs you can turn as well. Okay, so once that is complete, uh, we can export that. So I'm gonna go ahead and export that to code. So instead of doing this whole process I just did interactively, I can generate MATLAB code. And next time when I get 
uh, new data, I don't have to do this process interactively again. So let's take a look at what that MATLAB code looks like. So that'll just take a second. Then I'll go over to MATLAB here. So here's the, the live script that it automatically generated. The key things I want to point out here are we can see the code that is needed to do that augmentation. Um, part of that is also resizing the image. So remember, we needed to resize the images to match the network input size. And then we have the training options. So where how we set our max epochs, our mini batch size, learn rate, and so on. By the way, there are many more options to choose from. Those three are just the most common uh, basic options. Uh, like I said before, you can always right click on uh, the functions in MATLAB and get more help to, to learn more about the different options. Okay, so if I go back to the script now that we were working with before, you can see if I wanted to do this programmatically, instead of using the deep network designer, I could have used a few lines of code here to uh, replace those last couple of layers. That's what this code here is doing. And then here, this should look exactly familiar to uh, what you saw in the auto-generated script. Uh, here's my data augmentation piece portion. Here's my training options. And then, uh, so if I were to run this, it would do the training again. So we've saved the output, uh, the trained network in a variable called myNet. So now I can use that myNet to make classifications, uh, make predictions on new data. So just like before, I need to resize my test data. So I don't need to do all the other augmentation where I translated it and rotated it, I just, but I still need to do the resize step. So once I do that, I can uh, classify uh, the test data and we'll see how we did. So again, this isn't a whole lot of data to work with. I believe we have 15 test images, but you can see it did, it did pretty well. Uh, for trip anosomiasis, we got five out of five. And you could see for babesiosis and plasmodium, it, it got a couple of those wrong. So you can use this confusion matrix as a way to, uh, to, to try to help understand where the network might be struggling. So you know, maybe we wanna add some more images in those two categories to, to help, help with the training. And then finally, if we wanted to just look at a single image, we could do this. Here's one that uh, it got wrong. But you can see that uh, when, I, when I used that classify method, I also asked it to return the scores, which give us uh, some understanding of how confident the network was. So in this case, it predicted to be babesiosis, but it wasn't very confident. It was only about 53%. Okay, so before we uh, go back to the slides, I promised you that we would talk a little bit about how you can go about choosing these values here for your, for your training options. So one of our newer apps is called the Experiment Manager. And when you open it up, this is what it'll look like. You can create a new file. I already have one uh, set, so I'm gonna go ahead and open that up. So you'll notice it also uses projects. So when I, when I opened that up, it went ahead and closed my other project and opened the experiment manager project. If you created a new one, you would see basically the same thing, except these numbers wouldn't be populated here. Okay, so I went ahead and said, I want you to run uh, experiments where you compare three different learn rates and three different mini batch sizes. So that would be three times three equals nine different uh, experiments that it's gonna run. When you open this, it also creates a template. I went ahead and edited that template. So this is the function it's gonna use to set up the experiments. So it should look very similar to what we did in the other live script, where we uh, used a data store to gather images. We divided it into a 70-30 split. We set up AlexNet and modified the last couple of layers use data augmentation, and set our training options. The one major difference here though, is you'll notice now my mini batch size and my initial learn rate are parameters. 
Uh, so instead of hard coding those values here, it'll use the values that I had in my um, design manager, uh, experiment manager. So I could run that, but I already have the results for that. So you can see it ran through all nine of those trials. In this particular case, it looked like uh, this was a good combination. So an um, initial learn rate of one e to the minus four and a mini batch size of eight. So that's one way that you could more systematically or programmatically uh, determine what those values should be. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna jump back into the slides. Okay, so we covered a lot of the pieces of the workflow, but I'm gonna kind of just add a little bit more. And then also you'll have these slides uh, to look at after the, the seminar. So the steps for the, the workflow, we have to start with data. So we talked about preparing data, data using image data stores to split it into a truth set, or sorry, a, a training set and a testing set. We trained a model. And then the last step would be to deploy, uh, to auto-generate code to deploy to a specific uh, hardware target. So as you can imagine, this is an iterative process. Rarely do you go through this once and everything's perfect. You learn along the way, you make changes, and you refine your design. But just to focus on each of these three, we talked about uh, data stores. So one question we get is, how do I access large data that might not fit into memory? So one option might be a, a data store. If you have numeric data uh, that's too big to fit into, into memory, we have something called tall arrays, which make it much easier to work with data that's too big to fit into memory. If this is something you're interested in, uh, definitely check out the examples. Uh, they'll help you get started. And then what if you have an imbalanced data set or not enough data? So we, in our case, we simply uh, minimize the amount of data by getting rid of all the extras. Um, often uh, you could end up with a situation where then you don't have enough data. So we talked about data augmentation, but there's also the concept of creating synthetic data. So here we have a generative adversarial network that is actually uh, generating images of faces uh, from noise. So you could then use this data to train another uh, network. Likewise, you could create synthetic data also just from uh, MATLAB or Simulink. If you have a model of, of, what, of your plant, you could generate synthetic data that way and then use that for training. So you see that a lot in predictive maintenance where maybe you have a model of, of, a, of a windmill and you can generate a lot of windmill data and then you could determine when that windmill might have a failure, for example. For semantic segmentation, I mentioned that labeling that can be a very tedious process, going through pixel by pixel and labeling images. So we have an app that helps you do that in a semi-automated way. So that can make that process much less painful. Uh, for the training, uh, training of the model, so how do you improve your network if it's not performing well? So uh, in the machine learning portion of the workshop, we we talk about hyperparameter optimization. So that is where you're gonna use Bayesian optimization uh, to help you pick the, uh, the optimal values to, uh, for those training parameters. Uh, I showed you the experiment manager. So for deep learning, you could use the experiment manager to experiment with different combinations of those training parameters. And then once you have a network, we've got tools for visualization and debugging. So over here on the right, you see a class activation map. So that's what CAM stands for. And what that is, is essentially you can, you can look at different layers, different uh, uh, pieces of the network, and look at the class activation map for that layer. And what that means is it's showing you the place on the image that the network is finding interesting at that point. So maybe uh, this is a class activation map from layer, later, one of the later layers and maybe it's interested in classifying between dogs and cats, and it's interested in this fuzzy dog ear because it's starting to distinguish between uh, you know, fuzzy dog ears and pointy cat ears, um, as an example. We also talked about the confusion matrix, matrix. so that can, that can help you figure out which categories 
uh, your network might be performing poorly on. So you might have noticed if you had a really sharp eye that when I was training, it said that I was training on a single GPU. If you were to run this on a CPU, it would have taken a probably, in this simple example, probably three times as long, a couple times as long, but often it could be much, much uh, longer than that even. Uh, so hardware is one way you can speed up your training. If you don't have access to a GPU uh, in person, you can access GPUs in the cloud and use MATLAB on virtual machines or set up, um, be able to access that through MathWorks Cloud Center and access it directly in MATLAB. You can also make changes to software. So simplifying your network, we talked about how a very small learning rate can cause training to take much longer. So you could experiment with increasing the learning rate. And if you have a really small mini batch size, there can be some computational uh, overhead costs of moving that data around a lot. So that's another uh, parameter you can play with. If you had validation data, you could have the training uh, stop uh, when certain validation criteria are met. So then you, you don't have to run the training out as long. If you want to interoperate with other frameworks, uh, MATLAB can, uh, it can be used with the Open Neural Network Exchange to pull in uh, other networks. Or if you've created a network that you think would be valuable to the community, you can share that uh, through Onyx as well. If you or your colleagues is using Python, uh, MATLAB can co-execute with Python. So it doesn't have to be an all or nothing approach. Uh, you can call MATLAB from Python and Python from MATLAB. Finally, uh, deployment. So the workshop also covers this piece in much more detail. Uh, so you can generate code C++ and C code for CPU targets, CUDA code for GPU targets, and HDL code for FPGA and ASICs. Uh, so why might you want to do this? Well, here's an example of semantic segmentation where we're trying to segment out the pixels in this image. So we're trying to say, what's a car? What's the street? What's a building? Um, and that can be pretty computationally intensive. So running this in MATLAB on a desktop, it was running at about seven frames per second. You put it on a GPU running native CUDA code, and you can up that by about 5x to 35 frames per second. So if you can imagine um, autonomous driving, you know, you're gonna need those algorithms to run as quickly as possible. There are also other options. So you can uh, generate standalone applications for desktop users. So they can use your application without requiring a MATLAB license. You can create, compile applications for enterprise systems, compile libraries to integrate with other libraries, or sorry, other languages. Uh, compile packages for MATLAB production server. And then we, we already talked about uh, the coder products. Okay, so in summary, uh, just have a couple more uh, slides left. Uh, so, and then we'll, we'll get into the questions. So what does MATLAB offer for all of this? So first, uh, ease of use and thorough documentation. So I often tell people don't ever start with a blank sheet of paper. Uh, there's often a, a documented example that can get you half of the way, maybe even 80% of the way there. Take a look at that example, modify it for your needs, save it, use it how you want. Uh, so that's a great way to kind of get up and running quickly. We also saw how apps can be used to do things interactively the first time, and then we could automatically generate uh, MATLAB code uh, to do them programmatically uh, in the future. And then not only generating MATLAB code, but we can also take that MATLAB code and then uh, generate code for embedded hardware as well. And the reason, as I mentioned, we might want to do that is so that it can run uh, faster for more real-time applications. In addition to that, there's also wide domain support. So, you know, we've kind of focused on images today, but um, there's also computer vision, text, audio, uh, sensor data, control system design. If you have 3D medical data, uh, you can do deep learning on that as well. So 
where do you go from here? So here are some resources for getting started. So we, I mentioned the documentation. I'm gonna talk about tutorials in a second. So you could, there are some self-service options. There's great community support. So oftentimes, uh, if you have a question, someone else has already had that question and it's been answered on MATLAB Answers. So if you just do a Google search, MATLAB and whatever you're interested in, uh, you'll probably find a, a few answers to start there. There's also MathWorks uh, support, of course, so don't be afraid to reach out to tech support via phone and email. And then if you need more tailored service, there's training and consulting. So I'd encourage you to talk to your account manager if you're interested in learning more about any of these. With regard to uh, self-serve, those tutorials I mentioned are available at MATLAB Academy. So if you're new to MATLAB, we have a two hour on-ramp. Uh, you don't have to do it in one sitting, but it's free, it's self-paced, uh, it's online, you don't need to install anything. That's a great way to kind of get started with MATLAB. From there, there's also one for deep learning and one for machine learning now as well. So all of these are self-paced online and uh, free. And then as I mentioned, there's also the MATLAB community. So if we don't have a function that does what you wanna do, the file exchange might, um, and then there's, there's MATLAB answers as well. So the last thing I wanted to mention before we kind of open it up is uh, the hands-on biomedical AI workshop. So I kind of, mentioned that earlier. If that's something that might be of interest to you, definitely talk to your account manager. Uh, we can do these uh, virtually now, so there's no need to do this in person. Uh, it, it, as part of that, we set up virtual machines with GPUs on them, so you don't have to worry about having hardware. Uh, you do, do everything in the cloud. So if that's something that you're interested in, definitely uh, talk to your account manager to learn more. So. That's all I had. I definitely want to save a few minutes here for questions. Um, Moore had Thank mentioned <laughs> a, a poll as well. So Moore, I'll let you, I'll let you mention the, the poll. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. It was very interesting. Uh, we're going to upload now a short poll that you can answer uh, really shortly, and then we can move to the questions. So just uh, a few minutes. Uh, maybe two minutes to answer the poll. It's only four questions. I remind you of our uh, YouTube uh, page for now, YouTube channel. You can join and see all the webinars, uh, this one and the, the last one and the, the next ones that's going to be uh, next week and the week after that.